In my last video, I tested out the VGA interface using a test pattern generator. But now what we need to do is produce a VGA interface that will read in data from RAM, from video RAM, and spew out those pixels to our VGA interface. So let's create a pixel generator. Now let's talk about what the pixel generator needs to do. So video RAM is going to be composed of 8K 16-bit words, and the pixel generator needs to read in word by word from video RAM that's going to exist somewhere, and then spew the 16 bits of those words out. Uh, we need several components to be able to pull that off. I'm going to need a way to count the address that we want to access to pull a specific word out of video memory. Let's, let's create a component to contain that uh, counting logic. Let's call it uh, VRAM address driver. So the first thing we need is a counter. And this counter needs to be 13 bits because that's the size of our video RAM. And obviously we're gonna need a clock. And we're gonna need a way to signal to this component that we want it to increment because again, we don't want it incrementing with every clock tick because this is gonna this is gonna return an address for us to fetch a word out of video memory. And once we have that word, we've got 16 bits that we need to spew out on every clock tick. So let's just create a pin that'll tell us when to increment. So we'll hook the increment up to the enable of the counter. Uh, now we always want our counter to count up. So let's wire power to the count up down flag. And we're never going to load the counter. We're just going to use the or asynchronous clear. Uh, so let's just um, wire this load to ground so we never load it. Now, obviously, you know, the output of this component is going to be the address as indicated by this counter. So and it will be an output. And let's just call it adder. And now I want this counter to always be synchronized with where we are uh, vertically and horizontally in our in our counts. So we need to know how big the horizontal and how big the vertical maximums are, and then we need to know where we are counterwise within those. And once we get to the very end, then that's when we want the counter to roll over back to zero. So first of all, we need to know where the max and the counts are. So let's create some inputs. So we want this clear to be triggered when we're at the very last pixel of the very last line, actually the next pixel at the end of the very last line. So uh, that means we need to be one pixel, you know, after on the horizontal line. And so once the count is at the max, then we're one pixel at, you know, after the end of the line. So let's put a comparator. And the comparator is going to be for the horizontal 10 bits with uh, unsigned, because these are unsigned numbers.
So there's our horizontal comparison, but now we need the vertical comparison. And if we think about this, uh, we need to be, we need to know when we are on the last line, which means that uh, we need to know when the count is equal to the max minus one, because the last line is actually one less than the max. So let's use a subtractor to figure that out. And so we want to compare this number to the count. When both of these are equal, then that's when we want the clear to occur. So in order to know that, we'll add these together. And that should take care of our video RAM address driver. Now, once we have an address, Presumably, we're going to send that address off to video RAM and we're going to get a data value back corresponding to that address. So we need a way to serialize uh, a word into bits. So let's build a bit serializer to do that. So our inputs and our outputs, uh, obviously, we're going to need a clock. And we also need to know when we have a value that we want to load to be serialized. We're going to buffer these words that we want to serialize. So uh, we're going to indicate to the component when we want the component to load the word uh, in order for it to be serialized. So that'll be indicated with a load signal. And then obviously we need the value, and that's going to be a 16 bit value because our our data bus is 16, 16 bits. Okay, so as I mentioned, we need this to be stored off. So let's put that in a register. And this will be a 16-bit register. And of course, it'll need the clock. Let's talk about the output. So what are we outputting? Well, we're outputting one bit. So let's put that, let's create our output first. How are we getting this output? We need all of the bits streamed out to this one output pin. So how are we going to do that? Well, easy way I can think of is to just bit shift every clock tick. So let's use the bit shifter. And we want to shift from left to right. And we want to shift one bit at a time. So number of bits. Will be set to one. So we need to get the least significant bit from the register. And we don't want to get it after it shifted. We want to get it before it shifted. 
So let's use a bit selector to do that. And our bit selector needs to be 16 bits and outputting one bit. And the select in needs to be selecting the zeroth bit. What do we want to do with the output of the bit shift? Well, my idea is to just have this thing free run all the time. And so an easy, a very easy way to do this is to simply wire the output into the input like that. The only trouble is, is how do we load it? So when we have a value in that we want to load, how do we load it? How do we get that value in here? Well, what we can do is use a multiplexer sixteen data bits to either take the value from the output of the bit selector, which would be the default case, or if load is high. take our D value and load it instead. Then we can take the output from the MUX and feed it into our register. So now it should become obvious then about what to do with write enable. It should just be high all the time because we're either taking the result of the bit shift or we're taking the result of the load and we're, you know, we're spewing the bits constantly. And if for some reason we get done shifting bits, then it's just going to shift zeros, which shouldn't, shouldn't really happen, but it doesn't really matter if it does. So that should take care of a bit serializer. Now, a footnote, you may ask, and it is pretty important. How do I know this should be done from the least significant bit to the most significant bit? Elements of Computing Systems, page 90. There's a comment in the top box that's talking about the definition of the screen component. And it says the pixel at row R from the top and column C from the left reflects the uh, C mod 16 bit. And then in parentheses, it says counting from LSB to MSB, least significant bit to most significant bit of the word found at screen, blah, blah, blah. So that's how I know that this should be shifting out from least significant bit to most significant bit. And now we have enough components put together to wire up our pixel generator. So let's do that. So. Obviously, we need the bit serializer that we just did. And we need the video RAM address driver. What are our inputs and our outputs? Well, first of all, clock, obviously. So next thing, if you'll recall the pixel margin generator, which I built on a previous video, its output is telling you whether or not you're in the active region or not. And that's exactly what we need to know in this component is when we're in the active region, thus requesting a particular pixel from a particular, from, from a given byte. So we just need to know when we're active. And you'll notice that um, we have these constants. We need to get them from somewhere. We're not going to hard code them, so we'll, we'll feed them in. Now, finally, we need coming in to this component, we need the word that's ultimately going to get shifted out by the bit serializer.
So let's define our outputs. Obviously, we need an address to ask for. And we need our pixel. How do we know when we want to increment the VRAM address driver? Well, we, we know that it needs to increment every 16 bits because the word sizes are 16 bits. So let's put in a counter that tracks that. So we want this to be five bits. We want it to count to 16. So we need this to be five data bits wide in order to do that. And it's always gonna count up. And it's never gonna load. So it'll just be cleared. Now, at what point does it need to be cleared? And that's where having the extra tick to count up to 16 comes into effect because we still want it to operate when it gets to 15. So, you know, zero to 15, it needs to be ticking out all those. As soon as it gets to 16, it needs to asynchronously clear and, and go back to zero. So let's use a comparison to determine that. And so what are we going to compare it to? We're going to compare it to 16. Also known as 10 hex. And when that's equal, we want to do the clear. Now, when do we want this counter to be counting? Well, we only want it counting when we're in the active area. So that's easy. So let's think about the timing of these operations. So this component is gonna ask for an address of video RAM and because our RAM in Logisim is always synchronous. We need a clock tick in order to be able to get the value of that RAM back. And then we're going to present that into this D input value of the bit serializer and load that value into the serializer. So obviously there, there's got to be two clock operations in order to do those two things. So how can we do that? Well, my idea is to just simply look at this counter. And so, for example, if we get to number 15, that means we're at the very last bit in the, what presumably would be the current uh, value that's loaded into the bit serializer. So we would then load the new value that we would presumably have sitting in at this input. So if we just put a comparison in here, looking for 15, uh, and then when, when it's equal, raise the load flag high, uh, then we'd get presumably the next value that would be sitting in input into the bit serializer. So 15 is F. And then when they're equal, we will raise the load and we can just always present whatever input is to this D because we're only going to load it when we want it loaded. Otherwise, it, it doesn't matter what it has in it. So then, so that leaves the question, when do we want to increment the address driver? Well, we want to increment it the tick before, because again, we have to inc we have to increment it. It's going to present the new address. Then there's got to be a clock tick to get the memory. And then there's got to be a clock tick to load it. So we just need another comparison that looks for uh, the tick, the, the counter being equal to 14. When this is equal, 
that is an indication that we want to increment our uh, RAM, our video RAM address driver. Now the rest of these values are pretty straightforward, so I'll go ahead and fill them in. This completes the pixel generator. So let's add our pixel generator to our VGA driver. Now, our memory input, again, our VGA driver itself is not going to have any RAM. We'll hook that up separately. So we just need to get the input from RAM. And then this component is going to output, obviously, the address that it wants to get this memory for. And since it's VGA, let's go ahead and have it output RGB, even though it's going to be the same value. How do we test this? Well, we could hook up some RAM, and then, of course, we'd have to fill the RAM with something. And really, that's what that's the whole purpose of our CPU in the first place. But it's kind of too many steps. I just want to prove that we can kind of see something. So my idea is just let's just do a driver test, a VGA driver test, and put a ROM component in. And then let's just fill the ROM with some values and see if we can see the display. So let's just create a uh, VGA driver test, I guess. And so we need ourselves a VGA driver. And we need some ROM so that we can spit some values out. And this ROM will be 13-bit address, followed by 16 bits of data. So that gives us an 8K ROM, which is the right size for our video, for our video memory. And the output address from our driver is going to be driving the ROM. And the output from the ROM will be fed into the data, the, the data value of it will be fed to the input memory value of the VGA driver. And so we'll need a clock, and I won't do a pin. We'll just create the clock because we're going to synthesize this. But we will define output pins for the VGA interface. So what do we want to display? Well, an easy thing to display would be maybe a one line of pixels on the top and one line of pixels on the bottom. That'll be fairly easy to identify on the monitor. And so how many data values would that be of, of all ones? Well, it would be, since we have a 512 pixel display horizontally, uh, that would be 32 16-bit words of ones. Obviously, I could create a ROM file to do this, but this is almost faster. We should be able to synthesize this now. Forty-eight megahertz of tick frequency, which will yield twenty-four megahertz of clock frequency. And on my CMOD A7, I have the pins marked as so. Horizontal sync, 
vertical sync, and then R, G, and B. And of course, the uh, pr prior video I did, I talked about the electrical connection, so I'll refer you to that in case you uh, are coming into this without seeing that. Okay, synthesis is done. Let's load the design. And let me flip over to monitor and turn the PCB on. I'm gonna hit the program button. And we should see two lines appear. Monitors come on, oh, yep, and there they are. And I'm sorry they're out of focus, but um, they are thin, two thin lines, top and bottom on our monitor. So this indicates that our VGA driver is working. Thanks for watching.